of the uh, matrix factorization or the uh, singular value in PCA, stuff that we started talking about in the previous lecture, and move on to lane factor models and non-negative matrix factorization. But first, I want to make an announcement. The Southern California Machine Learning Symposium is on April 8th in San Diego, hosted by UCSD. Um, if you're interested in participating, especially if you're a PhD student who might be interested in learning more about machine learning, this is a great opportunity. You can submit an abstract for a poster. Uh, I think the poster abstracts are due uh, on Friday. It's a fairly lightweight process, it's a short one to two page abstract. Um, and again, the symposium itself is on April 8th in uh, UCSD. Uh, you can find the website here, it's also easy to find. So Calumel Symposium 2020, San Diego, easy to find on the web as well. So it's just an announcement. Um, I believe uh, the SoCalMo Symposium will be coming back to Caltech in a couple of years, but you know, who wants to wait that long? Okay, um, so today uh, I'll start talking about uh, some more about matrices, um, in particular lean factor models and non-negative matrix factorization. Uh, just to recap, uh, we spent a lot of time in the previous lecture talking about orthogonal matrices. And a matrix U is orthogonal if U, U transpose and U transpose U both equal to the identity. Uh, what that implies is that every column of U is a unit vector, so U transpose U, or little u transpose little u is one. And any two distinct columns, U and U prime, are orthogonal. What that means is that U transpose U prime equals zero. Uh, U uh, is a rotation matrix. It can be interpreted as a rotation matrix, excuse me. And U transpose is its inverse rotation. In other words, if x prime equals u transpose x, then x prime is been uh, you know, rotated to a new coordinate system, and we can reverse that rotation uh, by simply multiplying x prime by u to get x back. That's the basic idea. Um, any subset of the columns of u defines a subspace. So, for example, in particular, if we take the first k columns of u, uh, and then we uh, we, we uh, you know multiply that to x with a matrix vector product, we get a new x prime, but the new x prime is lower dimensional than the previous x. It's only k dimensional as opposed to the original dimensions. And then we can, of course, uh, and if, excuse me, on the, uh, on the figure on the right is an example from two dimensions to one dimension. So here in, in the example on the right, uh, k equals one. And so we just have this one dimensional uh, process. And of course, we can reverse this uh, we can reverse this transformation by just multiplying uh, by u, the first k columns of u, and we get back the, what, what's called the, the reverse projection of uh, x onto the subspace u. And that's what you see at the bottom right corner. So the bottom right corner, so the top, excuse me, so from the top you have this two-dimensional space, we project it onto u, just, just the one uh, vector u, which is this diagonal vector, and we get this coordinate system, and we want to re, re uh, unproject that, uh, un, uh, excuse me, reverse that back to the original coordinate system, we get back this uh, set of data points, which is just the original data points projected onto that vector u. And this projection is also known as what's typically known as a low rank subspace of the original uh, data space. The singular value decomposition is a very powerful tool that builds upon these ideas. In particular, the singular value decomposition takes the data matrix X, where every column of X is a data point, and every row is a feature value of, of all the data points. And we decompose this matrix capital X into U sigma V transpose. This is the standard notation people use for the singular value decomposition, where U and V are orthogonal matrices, and sigma is diagonal, which means anything not on the diagonal, is, it must be zero. And then what people do is they take the first k uh, columns of u, and they, and they, and they use that to, uh, to define a lower dimensional uh, subspace of the data points. It turns out because of the special properties of the singular value decomposition, uh, this is the low dimensional subspace, the k-dimensional subspace, uh, that has the smallest residual when you, try to, when you look at the, what's not captured in the projection. And, that's, and that is measured uh, using the square distance in the bottom equation. So what that means is that uh, the singular value decomposition gives you a handle on finding a low dimensional subspace of, uh, of degrees of freedom k, or dimensionality k, that captures as much of the variability of the data as, possi as is possible 
in a k-dimensional subspace of the data. We started the previous lecture, or we started the second half of the previous lecture talking about uh, principal colon analysis, uh, or PCA. Um, and it turns out that PCA and SVD um, basically are the same things, and that's given by the, uh, by the uh, equation at the bottom, by just manipulating the, the identities. You can show that they're equivalent, or there's a bijection between We also talked about eigenfaces, so which is just a kind of fun little application of, um, of SVD and PCA, uh, where the input data is represented as pixels or images of uh, people's faces. Where now, we can think of you as the basis faces, which uh, in this particular visualization is 12. And, uh, and all faces can then be thought, can be approximately reconstructed, or uh, as linear combinations of these 12 basis faces. In other words, we're projecting all the faces onto this 12-dimensional subspace. And, the, and the, each V, each, each, uh, excuse me, each column in V transpose corresponds to the coefficients that correspond to any individual face in the data set. Any questions on that recap? Okay. Um, so we can talk about norms and matrices, uh, similar to how we can talk about norms and vectors. They get a little bit more complicated for matrices, but um, to a large extent, uh, this, uh, it has many similar intuitions as norms for vectors. So the Frobenius norm is probably the most uh, is, the, is the most classical norm, um, and it's simply the square root of the sum of squares of the entries. So the square Frobenius norm looks a lot like the two norm of a uh, oh, it's the square two norm of a vector. You can also show that it's equivalent to the sum of the, 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 square, the square root of the sum of squares of the singular values under the singular value decomposition. Now the trace norm is kind of more interesting. Um, it's defined uh, it has many definitions; they're all equivalent. Uh, the most common definition is the sum of the uh, is the sum of the absolute values of the singular vectors. It turns out that the singular uh, singular values are um, guaranteed to be non-negative, at least for real value matrices. And so the sum of the absolute values and the singular values is the same as the sum of the singular values. So I omitted the absolute value there. Uh, it, has, it has a few other equivalent uh, formulas. So we can you know, talk about interesting properties of matrix norms. So for example, we can um, use one of the identities of the matrix norm. So uh, the way people talk about matrix dot products is typically as, so uh, if you want to take the matrix and product of x with itself, uh, one way to write it out is the trace of x transpose x. You can check that that is the sum of squares of, that is, excuse me, you can check that that is the sum of squares of the entries of x. Um, and in general, if x was just a vector, this just gives you the, the standard uh, dot product. And so we can use the identity of the singular value decomposition. This is, this is actually a very simple proof um, to show that the Frobenius norm written in this form is equal to this form. So you, re you replace x with its singular value decomposition. You do a bunch of uh, manipulation using matrix linear algebra and the fact that the trace operator is rotation invariant. So we can rotate the terms around. And you get this. So the, the since u's and v's are uh, orthogonal matrices, they, they U transpose U and V transpose V, or uh, they cancel out to the identity matrix. So you get back this guy. And since sigma is a diagonal matrix, the trace of the diagonal matrix uses that. So this is a simple four step, five step proof using standard manipulations of matrix linear algebra and the definition of the singular value decomposition. And you get that, you, know, you get this equivalence that the sum of the, that the sum of the squares of each entry of the matrix is equal to the sum of squares of the singular values of that matrix. And we also exploited the fact that uh, the trace operator is rotation to the mall to the term to multiply inside. Uh, we did the same thing uh, for the trace norm. Uh, the trace norm uh, can be written as um, 
can be equivalently written as the trace of the uh, square root of the inner product, um, the matrix square root. And I won't go through the details. If you're interested, you can, you can follow this yourself. Uh, the, the steps are not important. The, the key idea is to understand that these are just fairly standard manipulations of uh, matrix linear algebra and some properties of the singular value decomposition. OK, so now we're going to talk about matrix norms by analogy to how we use them in the vector for, uh, uh, setting, at least in, in the context of regularization. Uh, that's, that's what we're going to build up to. Um, you can think of the Frobenius norm uh, for the purposes of regularization as the matrix version of the L2 norm that we use for vectors. Right, so the L2 norm is was just, a, or at least the squared L2 norm, we always use the square in machine learning. The squared L2 norm is just the sum of squares of the entries of a vector, and we use that for regularization purposes. If you have a matrix, and you want to regularize the matrix for whatever reason, let's say you have, let's say you have a matrix of parameters, you can do the same thing. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about sparsity. Right? So recall that in the vector uh, setting, a vector is considered sparse if it's mostly zeros. So it's very few non-zero entries. And in precise terms, that means that it has small L0 norm. But L0 can, it is, is hard to actually optimize because it's this flat and discontinuous uh, norm. It's not even a norm, by the way. It's, 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 it's called a norm sort of um, uh, informally. What people use instead is the L1 norm. Because the L1 norm uh, is uh, a, it's a convex and continuous function that induces sparsity. And it's just the sum of the absolute values of the entries of the uh, parameter vector that you're estimating. So it turns out that there is actually an analogy. And this equal sign is per, oh yeah, the, of the eigenvalues. Right? So there's a close analogy between the trace norm and the L1 norm. In particular, you can think of the trace norm as the L1 norm of the eigenvalues, or the singular values. So a matrix is considered low rank if it has few non-zero singular values. So uh, in particular, uh, the rank norm of a matrix can be simply written as the sum of the indicator variables of the number of non-zero singular values. And so of course, this if you want to estimate a matrix that's low rank, um, if that's your regularization uh, condition, then this is not a uh, this is not an easy a norm to optimize. In fact, it's not actually a norm at all. It's only used as a norm informally uh, because it's flat or discontinuous everywhere. And so, what people instead optimize for is the trace norm, which is the sum of the singular values of the of the of the matrix whose parameters are estimated. And so, this is also used as a regularizer. In fact, this is a a very common one. If you, have, if you ever take um, um, ACM um, 113, you'll learn all about um, interesting properties of trace norm regularization for matrix value optimization, convex optimization problems. But we're not going to. We're only going to talk about it a little bit in this lecture. So you know, the, the full a full um, treatment of it is beyond the scope of this class. And there's a few other useful properties. Um, uh, these are fairly standard ones, like uh, uh, Cauchy Schwartz, arith arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequalities, uh, and uh, some other properties. Uh, these are fairly standard. You can find them in any sort of matrix cookbook of identities that you can use, identities and inequalities that you can use to manipulate um, these norms. Have any of you taken ACM 113? Okay. Well. If this kind of if if if, if doing this kind of stuff uh, is stuff that you find very uh, fascinating, uh, if that's a great class to do some further follow-up uh, work in this space, we'll also do a little bit of this in homework five. But again, full treatment is beyond the scope of this class. Uh, okay, so just to recap, um, and we, have, we talked about the single value decomposition and principal component analysis in a very strong sense that are equivalent to each other, and the major use case of these is to, after you compute the SVD or the PCA, 
just take the first k columns of the U matrix that comes out of the decomposition and use that for a lower, to define a low-rank subspace that we're going to project the data onto uh, because this low-rank projection is useful for, any, for many downstream tasks, which is sort of, a, uh, sort of a, 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 the, the theme that people use uh, in unsupervised learning to define these low-dimensional summaries of the data that are useful for some kind of downstream task. Any questions? Yes? Uh, how do you usually, like, is there a way that people decide, like, how much K should be? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so the question um, is, how do people decide um, how, uh, what K should be? I'm going to give you the answer you're probably going to expect me to give at this point, which is we have a validation set. So that's one way to do it. Another way is to look at the, um, is to look at the, 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 the magnitude of the residual. So in practice, as k increases, uh, the residual goes down. And as if k equals the size of the full dimension, the, then the residual is zero. We can exactly recover the data because we're using a, a full dimensional rotation in that case. And so you can actually look at uh, what people typically do um, is they try to eyeball it, um, where the, the residual goes down, goes down, goes down, and at some point it's going down very steeply. And after a while, it only goes down very slowly. And people, one rule of thumb, if you're not too picky on what K to use, is to pick a K at what's called the elbow of the residual curve. Um, if you are very picky, like I need three, then you get, you, you have three. Okay, latent factor models. So we're gonna, we're gonna sort of change things around a little bit. Um, we're no longer going to talk about, strictly speaking, unsupervised learning. We're actually going to talk about sort of a kind of weird in, uh, pro a reverse problem of unsupervised learning. So uh, to sort of uh, ground the discussion, I'm going to talk about the Netflix problem. The Netflix problem is a classic problem. It was first proposed in the late 90s or early 2000s. Um, and the problem is defined as follows. Um, we have. Uh, in this case, a matrix of ratings of n, uh, where each row corresponds to a user and each column corresponds to a movie. So y sub ij is the rating that user i gives to movie j. Um, and we, the goal is to be able to uh, um, solve for this prediction problem when only a subset of the ratings are filled in. So let's say um, only 20% of this matrix is filled in, 80% is, is, is missing values. Then how do we use that 20% of data to train some kind of model to be able to fill in the missing values? It, and the way people have typically gone, gone about doing this is to factorize this matrix into a low rank subspace. Now it turns out that if y was completely observed, then the factorization is just the SV. So assume, assume that y was completely observed, then the factorization is just the standard singular value decomposition, where the U matrix corresponds to a set of, um, I guess in this case, U corresponds to a set of uh, K features that describe any given user and the V matrix corresponds to a set of K features that describe any given movie. And how the user I would rate movie J is just U, U, sub, U sub I transpose V sub J. One of the things that's interesting, and I'll talk about the missing value problem in just a second, but one of the things that's interesting is that you, you can actually visualize these using these. So for example, this is, a, this is a paper from, I guess, about 20 years ago now. Um, where they took a two-dimensional uh, projection of the original U's and V's, so they further projected down the two dimensions, and then they just uh, you know, took, the, took the feature values and put you know, random uh, some movies onto, this, onto, this, uh, onto the space, uh, and then the, uh, they made some interpretation of what the axes mean based off where the movies were. So the first uh, horizontal axis is sort of Stereotypically geared towards females or stereotypically geared towards males. Apologies for the gender gender role thing. This is from a fairly old paper. 
Um, and then the vertical axis is serious versus escapist. Um, and they, they came up with those labels based on just eyeballing where the movies landed like in, in this two-dimensional space that was the, the subspace that was extracted from, from the um, ratings matrix. And the way you get this is, the, is based off some statistical properties. So similar users, the assumption is as follows. Similar users will tend to rate similar movies the same. And similar movies get rated by, get rated, get rated get correlated away by, by, by the same user. So users who like uh, escapist movies will rate the movies like Independence Day uh, more highly. Um, escapist is perhaps a fairly liberal uh, label of that axis. And more serious movies, the users who like more serious movies will rate the opposite side more highly. And now we, we visualize these things. These days, people use things like T-SNE, if you're familiar with that term. But back in the day, people use stuff like this. OK. Of course, just as I had mentioned before, in the actual Netflix problem, there are many missing values. So Y uh, is actually mostly missing. And what people typically call U and V in the case where Y is missing values is they call U and V um, uh, latent factors. This, this problem is formally known as the collaborative filtering problem, which you may have heard of. If you're planning on taking CS156B in the spring term, you actually spend the entire term thinking about the collaborative filtering problem. Um, so you have n users and n items, uh, and a small subset of user, user item pairs have ratings, and most are missing. Uh, this is applicable to any kind of recommender system problem, where um, a small subset of user item pairs have ratings, and yet most are, are missing because the user has not been exposed to this item thus far. And the goal is to predict the missing values, predict the rating that this user would have given this item. So what is interesting about this problem? So this is sort of like the reverse of super, unsupervised learning. In this case, we only have labels and we have no features, or at least that's what it looks like, right? We have this, we have this, a rating that user I gave, uh, gave uh, item J for some subset of user item pairs, and that's it. So the goal is to actually learn a latent representation over users and movies or items uh, such that we can uh, minimize, such that we can learn to predict um, the missing values. And the way we even express that is with the following learning formulation as that you see below. So let's walk through this learning formulation. Um, we're going to learn U and V, both are matrices, both have dimension K by the number of users, or k by the number of items, or the transpose of that. Um, and given u and v, we assume that the, rate, the, the rating we predict for, for how user i rates item j is just that product between the corresponding uh, user vector and item vector. So it's just a linear model. But we're learning both u and v simultaneously, rather than, than just one or the other. And of course, uh, we, want this thing, we want this thing to generalize. In particular, what that means is that we want this thing to, we want this model to be able to predict uh, unseen data that held out missing values, or the missing values that we don't observe. And so we, want, we don't want these things to overfit to the, to the values that we do observe. So we regularize. And we're going to regularize, in this case, in the obvious way, just for matrices. And what does that mean? That means we are, we are regularized by the square root convenience norm of U and V. And the loss function is, uh, is regression, so it's squared, squared loss. Any questions? Okay. So this is where uh, things get a little interesting, at least from a mathematical analysis point of view, uh, it turns out that suppose that the variations between uh, how users, uh, within users and how they rate items, and in this case, sort of symmetrically between how items are related to each other and, and are rated by users, suppose that variation is actually low rank, which means all that variation is captured in some k-dimensional subspace, or some k-dimensional latent space. 
uh, that implies that some uh, k-dimensional uh, k u and v um, will actually achieve um, will actually achieve that, um, that perfect recovery. And so, what does that mean? That means that suppose we have a u and v that can achieve perfect reconstruction. So, y is perfectly reconstructed when u v transpose. Then, then square loss is by definition zero. So it's the square loss is by definition zero, and we're simply finding the u and v that's that's the least complex under some regularization penalty uh, that achieves perfect square loss. So, so we're going to find the u and v such that u tra uv transpose gives you perfect square loss. So this is equal. That has the lowest uh, penalty under some regularization penalty. Here we're going to penalize the squared Frobenius normal u and v. It turns out that this is actually equivalent to um, find, this is equivalent to estimating the y that has the lowest trace norm. So recall that y has recall that y has um, many missing values. So suppose I want to estimate a y matrix that fills in all the missing values, but is consistent with the observed values. But I want to find that y matrix that has the lowest trace norm. Turns out that that's mathematic equivalent to uh, finding a factorization of y with the lowest square root sum of square root these norms. Um, the proof, at least, in, so this is equivalent, so it's uh, if and only if. So you can prove one direction uh, using um, you know, some actually pretty standard uh, manipulations of matrix on the algebra and some uh, inequalities that I just presented in the previous slide. Uh, of course, uh, searching for this proof might take you time consuming, but the actual proof is only, in this case, five lines long. Um, so just to give you an idea that there are these strong connections between these different norms. And there are actually, if you actually are interested in dig into it, there are very strong geometric interpretations of what's happened. But going back to our um, going back to our, our link factor model, this is our objective. Now we cannot guarantee in general that this guy will be zero. So the original analysis, the previous analysis I put in the previous slide, was assume that the squared loss here, we can achieve zero squared loss. And in general, we don't want to do that. So we get this full loss function. As I related to before, this is related to finding a, a, a matrix W. So now I have a matrix of parameters W, and I regularize by its trace norm, and I simply minimize the dis distance of its entries. The two objective functions are actually very closely related. And there is a condition when, there, when these two objectives are equivalent. So this is actually the learning problem. These two, since since um, they're essentially they're very closely related and under some conditions equivalent, what we're basically saying is we're saying with this with the with the with the first learning objective, which is very natural for us to think about in machine learning right now. Um, we're basically saying we want to find a low rank of we want to find a low rank matrix whose uh, whose entries match the observed entries as closely as possible, and we could use this low rank matrix to then fill in the missing values of the of the entries that we don't observe. One thing that's interesting about this particular problem is that in the, in the beginning we don't have features, right? So we only get the supervised label and no features. So, so if we actually look at, this problem is actually very symmetric in some sense. So if we had the features for the items, this problem is just least squares regression, right? So V is fixed. If we had V magically, V is fixed, and we're just unloading U, linear regression. If we had the user item, user features, we have features describing what users, users are interested in, then U is fixed, and we, are learn, we want to learn V, the features for the items, or the, the weights for the items. And so this is, again, just linear regression. So there's a symmetry here, at least from the perspective of linear regression, that U and V are both parameters and features. So this is, you know, people refer to this as feature learning. 
or representation learning. Nowadays, people do more fancy stuff, but you know, it, it, it all started here. Any questions so far? Okay, so the next thing I'm just going to briefly talk about is a little bit of optimization. So again, uh, we only train over the observed wise, and I'm just gonna—I just wrote a, another notation up here just because um, if sometimes people use this particular notation. I, I don't—I'm not a huge fan of it, but um, it is used sometimes, and I just thought I'd get you guys comfortable with all the different notations. So this one says I'm going to sum over all the data points, and I'm going to mask out some of them if I don't observe them. That's what this omega is. So it's mathematically equivalent to everything we've seen so far. But this is also a notation that's quite common. So the way we optimize um, is typically, so the most common way to optimize is through gradient descent. Um, and I'll just walk through uh, and, uh, what gradient descent looks like. Um, so you compute the gradient of, you know, uh, in, in this case I want to compute the gradient of uh, a column of u. So, the, 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 the derivative with respect to uh, column u sub i. Um, and so here, I'm going to hold v fixed. Um, and it just looks a lot like the gradient for, uh, the gradient for linear regression. Uh, by symmetry, um, I do the same thing for any, for any v. Just, I just swap things around. So from the, perspective, from the perspective of u, it looks just like the gradient for linear regression. From the perspective of v, it looks just like the gradient for linear regression. And that's what we do. We do some sort of alternating stochastic gradient descent, where we, you know, pick, we, we pick some subset of the parameters to optimize. In this particular case, we pick a single column. And uh, we hold all the other parameters fixed, and it just looks like gradient descent. Of course, one thing that's different is that the next time I go through this column, next time I, I touch this column, the v's will have changed, right? Because I'm also learning the v's. So the v's will have changed. Whereas in normal linear regressions, the v's always stay the same. But at least in terms of a single step of the gradient descent, it just looks like linear regression. And so this is just a general recipe. Um, you choose one of the columns. Um, oh, sorry, this is this is alternative. Sorry, excuse me. I got ahead of myself. Uh, this is an alternative, which is you can actually, as you know from homework um, from homework one. Linear regression has a closed form formula, right? You can just solve the close analytic closed form solution of the optimum if you were able, to, if you were willing to invert this matrix, which can be very expensive. But if you're willing to invert this matrix, linear regression has a closed form solution. Um, in all the problems that we're going to talk about in this class, that's cheap. You can actually you can actually invert the matrix. Um, and so, what, what another option is to do alternating closed form optimization. Which means we pick uh, u and v for v, and then we just solve for its optimal solution, assuming the v's are fixed. And then we pick another u or v and solve for its closed form solution, uh, assuming the, all the other parameters are fixed. And we just alternate this until we, you know, converge to something. So um, it should come as no surprise that this alternating uh, closed form optimization is much faster in terms of number of iterations, but requires inverting a matrix. Um, typically, uh, gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent is much faster for higher dimensional problems. Uh, and also allows you to stream the data. And of course, is what people use in practice for you know, real-world scale problems. Here's just another visualization. Um, in this particular case, they learned this latent factor model. 
Um, and they centered it around uh, Wizard of Oz and sort of showed where uh, some other movies were in, in their positioning relative to Wizard of Oz. Now keep in mind that the act in any individual direction itself has no meaning except for what are the cluster of movies that are in that direction. And that's how you can give meaning to these directions. Yes? So when doing this, do you specify the number of like, factors first? Typically, yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's a typically a, a, a hyperparameter. Just, so you, you, now you have two hyperparameters. You have the lambda, the regularization strength, and in your learning of algorithm, and then you have k. Now you have two hyperparameters. Uh, if you want to figure out how whether you're overfitting, you have a sub subset of your matrix, uh, matrix of uh, ratings, that's held out validation set, and then you tune k and lambda. Yes. Um, in the context of like uh, missing observation data, how, how what's the fraction of like uh, of data that I can be missing before this becomes impossible? Depends on two things, um, and this is a a topic of uh, intense theoretical interest, especially uh, certainly here at Caltech. So, um, uh, uh, Babak Hasibi in the EE department and Venkat Chandrasekharan in uh, my department and Joel Trop in my department have all studied that question very deeply. Um, and so it depends primarily on two factors. Number one, it depends on how low dimensional is the subspace. So if for whatever reason I could explain all the variability in a two-dimensional subspace, then I actually need very little missing data. I actually need very little observed data to actually infer that. Uh, so it depends on the rank, the, how, the dimensionality of this low-dimensional subspace of variability. How heterogeneous is my user population? Um, the second thing it depends on is the, is the noisiness or the vari variance of the ratings. So um, maybe, maybe for whatever reason, my, uh, you know, I have an average rating of you know, whatever, 0 0.7, let's say it's between 0 and 1 for, for simplicity, but then I gave a rating of 1 for whatever, because I, I was feeling generous that day. So people are not consistent, right? So they give, they give a rating that's maybe, and we model that as saying there's some corruption to the true rate. We call that noise, observation noise. And so the second factor that, that dominates the theoretical analysis is the magnitude of the noise in the, in the measurement noise. And those two things together uh, are the main tools that people use to analyze um, you know, how many missing entries, how many entries do you need to observe before you can fill in the rest of the People have written entire PhD thesis on this, so you can, you can like make up various assumptions and, and stuff. And what's the relationship between matrix factorization techniques and like topological algorithms like UMAP? I don't know what UMAP is. Uh, it's, a, it's a dimensionality reduction algorithm that basically like finds it like estimates the topology of the of your points and then like finds a two-dimensional topology that or two-dimensional like set space that has the same topology. I'd have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> Okay, so just to recap, uh, we talked about collaborative filtering, and the goal is to predict every, every uh, user item rating. And the challenge is only a sub small subset are observed. And the assumption is that there exists a low rank subspace that captures all or most of the variability describing why different users prefer different things. So if the low rank subspace is just one dimensional, then we all like the same stuff and we all hate the same stuff. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Just an aside. Um, I want to come. I want to come back to the idea of uh, multitask learning. We covered this very, very briefly. lecture four, when I talked about regularization and how regularization can be used to share information across different tasks. Um, 
I'm going to now briefly re revisit the multitask learning perspective and now give you a, a different inductive bias and in regularizing using matrix valued uh, regularizers. So here we have, you know, we're gonna we're gonna uh, make some simplifications. So we have um, some input feature x, and then we have multiple labels depending on the task. So this could be, you know, one task per user rating. And we have features of items. So this is our this this is the basic uh, learning formulation where we have this big W matrix where every column of the W matrix corresponds to a different task, and um, and we have some regularizer on this whole W matrix. So M corresponds to the number of users, let's say. Okay, so how do we regularize? Well, we can choose the standard L2 norm, which in this case is, is the squared Frobenius norm. But the problem with the squared Frobenius norm is that it actually decouples all the learning problems completely, uh, completely independently. So learning, uh, learning to optimize for one of these tasks is a completely separate learning problem than any of the other tasks. So we can just solve them independently. So that doesn't actually allow us to um, get any statistical strength from the fact that we think that the users are somehow related to each other. Well, another way to think about this is that for each task, we're learning d parameters, where d is the feature value, where d is the number of features in x. Okay, well, let's let's do the following. Suppose that we say, well, okay, we I believe that the weight matrix has low rank, which means that the variability of users and their interests. Uh, vary in some low-dimensional subspace. I don't know what that subspace is, but I believe that it is low-dimensional. And that, that basically means that W has to have low rank. Okay, so we, we can't directly minimize rank because the rank norm is not a real norm. It's, it's non-smooth uh, and it's discontinuous. Um, so we're going to minimize the, excuse me, the L1 analog to it, which is the trace norm. So it looks like that. Makes sense. And so we're going to go back to this equality, and we're going to just, for ease of optimization, um, replace the trace norm with uh, u with with uh, its factorized version. So we're going to excuse me, we're going to replace w with its factorized version. So w equals u v transpose. And now instead of minimizing the trace norm of w, we can minimize, minimize the sum of squared squared Frobenius norms of u and v because of this particular equality. And now we get something that looks like this. So let's walk through what this is. So each column of u uh, corresponds to the, a user-specific uh, parameter vector that we're learning for that user, for that task. And then we're going to learn a v that projects the features of the items into a low-dimensional subspace. And then afterwards, we'll do, we'll do a dot product with u. So what does this mean? This means that we're going to learn, and we're going to learn to project x into x prime, where x prime equals v times x, um, or maybe v transpose x. I might have gotten that matrix uh, shape wrong, but if, it's, if I did, it's just v transpose x. And then we're going to learn a k-dimensional model per task. Um, so let's think about the trade-off here. In the original learning problem, where we treated every task as, a, as an independent task. We're learning d times n. Per, uh, we're learning d times uh, m parameters. Excuse me, that should be m. Um, and then here, because we have this low rank subspace, we're learning d times k plus m times k. And so, um, this as the number of tasks grow and k stays constant, the lower number is going to be much smaller than the higher number. One more, there's one more condition, sorry. K is much smaller than D. So K is much smaller than D, and N, or it should be M, is the, is the thing that grows, so the number of users grow. So since that's the, that's the number, that's the variable that's growing, then this quantity, because D is much larger than K, at some point will be much larger than this quantity, in terms of the number of parameters we need to 
So what does this say? Does it say basically, I know that the users vary in this low dimensional way, even if there are many, many, many of them. So I'm going to learn a single, I'm going to learn a matrix that projects the items onto this low dimensional subspace, and then learn this user, uh, this simpler user per user model. So this just summarizes um, everything I said. And now, I'm going to go one step further in the mathematical formulation, or the, at least the formulation of the problem. I'm going to connect it back to the collaborative filtering problem that we just talked about. In particular, the feature value of every x is now just uh, a single uh, uh, a single basis vector. So the dimension of x is equal to the number of is equal to the number of items. So d d is the dimension of x. I'm going to set that to equal to, to be equal to the number of items. And the feature value of x is just an all zero vector with just a single one at its uh, at, at, at that associated uh, um, uh, item ID. And so what does that mean? That means that this guy with this definition of x corresponds exactly to the original collaborative filtering problem. So indeed, these two problems, you know, at least there's a there's an there's an umbrella framework that uh, that is that you know basically views these two problems as just slightly different slices of the same problem. Okay, but of course, you know, the way we are, so, so I guess my point in saying all this is that I'm basically using the same set of tools. I'm using matrix factorization, lane factor models, and low rank subspace assumptions to model, you know, two somewhat different problems, and it, it turns out to be uh, using the exact same modeling framework to model these two different problems. Of course, you know, you have to be slightly judicious in how you, how you apply this framework. And so with that comes sort of a little bit of interpretation. So we could try to interpret what it is that our model is trying to learn, right? So in the first one, we're trying to, we have these feature values that could be arbitrary feature values. Uh, uh, could be like, you know, which, which, which actor is in this, in this movie? You know, what genre is it? Um, could be whatever feature attributes you, you've collected plus the, plus the movie ID. Um, we project that onto this low dimensional subspace. And then we learn a low dimensional user model per task, per user. In the second interpretation for cloud filtering, uh, we don't have any features. We just have the movie or item ID. And we just learn this low dimensional feature for each movie and learn a low dimensional model per user. Of course, these interpretations are very related to each other. Um, but it's important to be able to uh, understand how to uh, arrive at these interpretations because it helps you build intuition and make sense of what the model is learning. The full framework is what's called a general bilinear model, where we have user features described as Z and item features described by X. Uh, people use different notation. This is the notation I'm choosing to use. And now, this is the full model right here, where I could have uh, user features that includes attributes like gender, age, whatever, in addition to the user ID. Um, and I find and I project that down to a low dimensional space. I project the items features onto a low dimensional space, and how much this user likes this item is a is a is a, inter, a linear dot product in this low dimensional space. And again, just to reiterate, the reason why these methods are so useful is that the number of parameters needed to learn these models is far fewer than if I try to model everything in the, as a big, giant, independent uh, each, uh, set of independent problems. For example, rather than you know the full the full joint model treating all these learning tasks independently has a number of parameters d times m, which is much bigger than uh, m times k plus d times k. Okay. 
far. Uh, in the simplest case, um, we started with just the SVD of uh, matrix Y. No missing values and just indicator features of user item, user ID, and item ID. So this, I call those indicator features. Uh, in the general case, we have our general, fe general high dimensional feature Z, general high dimensional features X, and we know that there exists a low dimensional, we assume that there exists a low dimensional subspace that characterizes the, the, uh, the model, and so we learn this low dimensional projection into this low dimensional linear model. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. So, everything I've described so far is, is a linear projection. So, it's a linear a, a matrix vector multiplication is a linear operator, and uh, we can also learn nonlinear mappings. And in fact, nonlinear mappings are all the rage these days uh, because of the. You know, the tremendous success of deep learning. And so, you know, we can do these nonlinear operators. So everything, everything I described um, in, the, uh, in the linear case, you can do in the nonlinear case. So, you know, so basically how the nonlinear case would work, I'm not going to talk about it in detail right in this lecture. Um, how the nonlinear case would work is that this V of that, this, you can think of this as a function, right? You have some function that maps X to a low dimensional of, uh, you have something that maps X to a k-dimensional space. So this is a fun this function is linear, V transpose X, where V is a matrix. In the simplest case, all we need to do, conceptually at least, is replace X with a, we replace this function with a neural net. I have a neural net that maps X to a k-dimensional output, and the training signal is how well. I have two neural nets, one that maps items. X to this k-dimensional output, uh, output space, the one that maps users to this k-dimensional output space. And my training signal is that the user items that like each other, the item users that like these items, they're, they're, they're in a product in this latent space should have a high rating. That's it. And so in that case, this objective function looks exactly the same, except this part is a neural net mapping, this part is a neural net mapping, and these are regularizations on the neural net parameters that is trained using gradient descent. And you can implement this on uh, PyTorch if you want, yes. So how would you find the Frobenius norm of the neural net? It's just the L2 norm of the weights of the neural net. Yeah. It, by analogy. You can admit, you, what I just described is actually pretty easy to implement on PyTorch if you want. So that's just that would be the nonlinear analogy, um, and, but I'm not going to talk too much about nonlinear nonlinear stuff in this lecture. But that's what people have been doing. Here's just one example of that. Um, if you're interested in details that are they appeared at this paper, ICCB uh, 2015, and uh, this is built. This is on. Uh, this is trained on um, Amazon. So um, Julie McCauley, uh, who was a uh, Currently, a professor at UCSD, he scraped Amazon, possibly violating terms of service, but anyways. And what he scraped was, um, you know, if you um, if you um, if you scroll on Amazon, you see this bar, you see this navigation pane at below the item descriptions, like users who bought this may also like this. He just he just took that as a rating, like oh, these two items are are commonly bought together, and so he just. That was the only learning signal. And then what he did was he actually trained a neural net that mapped pixels. So now x, x is the pixel values, the image of these items. And he mapped them to this k-dimensional space. And their dot product, let's say it's a dot product. It could be some other thing. But let's say, let's say their dot product is high if these are two items that tend to be purchased together. And the dot product is low if these are not two items that tend to be purchased together. That's the only learning signal. And you do gradient descent, and you put it across pixels, and that's it. And then you can learn this embedding, this, and to show you know combinations of things that um, the model can predict can, can be purchased together. So now you can generalize, right? One of the reasons why you do this is to generalize. I can give you a new picture of a new item that maybe has not appeared in Amazon before, and I can predict what do people want to buy with this. 
and this model will give you an answer. So we're going to spend the remaining 20 minutes or so talking about non-negative matrix factorization. Um, let's go back to PCA and SVD. So one of the things that came up in the previous lecture was, oh, do, do these things need to be orthogonal? Do they have to be orthogonal? Do they have to be orthogonal? It's a, it's a great question. I sort of punted on the question until, uh, until right now. Um, so the reason why PCA and SVD have to be orthogonal is by definition of PCA and SVD. But there are many, many data sets where orthogonality doesn't really make sense. So consider this data set, right? Um, everything in this data set is in the positive quadrant. So all the feature values in both features are positive. Even if I center it, you know, it's clear that somehow centering it and doing PCA doesn't make sense. It, it, and I, of course, constructed this data set, uh, this, this example, as a toy example, just to emphasize a point. But you know, if you squint, you can sort of see that you, there's these two bases along which items tend to tend to um, uh, be around. They, they're not necessarily clusters, although they per perhaps in this simple example they may, might look more like clusters. But in general, it looks like the bases are sort of not orthogonal to each other, right? Um, and this intuition, you know, of course, becomes more extreme in higher dimensions. And so that leads to the idea of non-negative matrix factorization. Now we're going, to, we're going to make the assumption that y is non-negative, so this, the, the, the signal matrix uh, is not, uh, is the label matrix is non-negative. And we're going to find non-negative u's and v's such that they factorize y. And y may or may not have missing values. That's uh, not so relevant in this part of the, uh, in this part of the lecture. And so we can do the same thing to the um, CS155 non-negative, uh, sorry, CS155 uh, face data set where we would do a non-negative math factorization. And now one of the nice things about this uh, factorization is that, well, the bases no longer, are no longer forced to be negative, uh, orthogonal. And furthermore, everything here is in true color because all the, all the bases are not negative, so I can just visualize, uh, visualize what they are in, 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 as a picture uh, without having to do some weird interpretation of what's going on. So the, the, we were actually looking at the values, the, the actual values of the bases. So now you can say, well, every person's face is now represented as a non-negative linear combination of these basic spaces. You know, we can again compare against the, so the, the SVD, which first requires mean shifting, and then everything, all the basis faces, basis faces, um, uh, have uh, had to be interpreted very carefully because dark is negative and light is positive, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, and aside on non-orthogonal projections, right? So, if if you force the projections, the basis vectors of the projection to be orthogonal, they must have negative components in them. Only at most, yeah, they, they must have negative components in them, typically. Unless they're the original basis. Um, yeah, unless the basis you recover is just the original axes. Um, just, if you just think about the, the definition of orthogonality, as soon as you rotate a little bit, you know, at least one of your uh, basis vectors has to have a negative component in it. Um, if you force every basis vector to be ha have only non-negative coefficients, then you know, it's not, the, the full vector is not orthogonal. And so people typically do reverse, in reverse transformations using what's called a pseudo-inverse. Another thing that uh, people think about is loss function. So, um, and this starts to become more interesting for um, non-negative um, learning over non-negative signals. Um, so, for instance, um, we talk a lot about squared loss, 
if you take the interpretation that the um, that the observed values have some sort of probabilistic interpretation, then we talk about other loss functions as well. So generalizations of uh, relative entropy, for example, which is similar to um, cross entropy, but a little bit different. And we can trade using gradient descent. And in fact, um, the second one is the one that I used to um, show the examples from before. So just to maybe give a little bit of intuition, um, in squared loss, I penalized just the uh, the uh, uh, the additive difference, right? So if if, if if A was the true value, was the value of the training set, and B is my prediction, I penalized the additive difference. The, the residual is measured additively. In generalized relative entropy, the residual is me measured multiplicatively. I penalized the relative. In particular, if A is greater than zero and B is zero, I suffer infinite loss. Okay. So just to um, summarize, PC and SVD, they find the best orth set of orthogonal basis vectors. And the basis vectors are typically have negative components in them, um, which makes them very tricky to visualize if they uh, they correspond to let's say images. Uh, they tend to lead to better reconstruction using fewer basis vectors, um, um, because this, uh, the the basis vectors capture more variations because they're orthogonal. Non-negative matrix factorization finds the best set of non-negative basis vectors, and so the coefficients must be non-negative. Um, this is often easier to visualize if these the inputs are images because you can just you know visualize them in, in, as their true as their true values. But typically, because of lack of orthogonality, you require more basis vectors to get a good reconstruction. So that's a trade-off. Okay. Um, I don't need to talk about this too much, but uh, just as an aside, we could also apply non-negativity to latent factor models. So everything I said about latent factor models. You can also enforce a non-negativity constraint. Nothing changes in terms of the optimization and anything else. It's just um, it makes if you care about non-negative activity, this may be easier to interpret. The last thing I will do is show you a very brief application to modeling um, sports analytics, which is something I worked on for a while. Uh, so the, uh, the raw data looks like this. So we have shooting profiles, um, which in this particular case, I just not, not super important, we discretized the, the basketball court on t into one by one foot cells. So there's 2,000 cells in the half court. And what we're measuring is, the propens is some notion of propensity of a particular player to shoot at a particular location on the court. Uh, this data is a little bit old, um, so it's a few years old now. Uh, but at that time, um, you may know him. His name is Tim Duncan. He played, used to play for the San Antonio Spurs. Um, you know, he's a very prolific shooter, and um, you know, that's his shooting profile. Unfortunately, most players don't play that much. Most players are not superstars. They only play a little bit, so we have very few data points for them. So this is a sort of a form of a missing value problem. And so we can do this uh, matrix factorization to try to fill in missing values. And so we have. Uh, and I'll, I'll skip the details, you can read the paper if you're interested. Um, the basic idea is that we learn these 10 basis vectors of, um, of, sh of I guess you can call them canonical or archety archetypical shooting profiles. And then every player, this is from the 2012-2013 season, so it's about six years old, this data set. Um, every player in this data set can be represented as a non-negative linear combination of these 10 archetypical shooting profiles. So now we've summarized every player using these 10 numbers, at least in terms of their shooting propensities. Uh, the data was collected um, from uh, real NBA games. And so this is, um, I think maybe, uh, this is um, sort of the, the prediction task. We have some definite description of the game state, and we have a description of the event. We want to learn the probability of the event uh, given uh, the game state 
And it's, so the learning signal, so again, there's this interesting thing where you have this learning signal, which uh, for most of this lecture was just squared loss, or, like, or linear, or just regression, if you will. And for this application, we decided, and there's a good reason for this, that we're gonna do logistic regression at the top learning signal. So uh, the probability of, of an event is equal to the exponentiation of some scoring function. Now the scoring function is no longer linear, it's actually the you know, it's actually the dot product of a latent factor model, um, but it's a scoring function divided by some normalization constant. So this is a standard uh, logistic regression uh, scoring rule. Just the inner scoring part is not a, just a simple linear model. So this scoring rule here is the dot product of these two uh, these two matrices. But otherwise, it looks a lot like logistic regression. And so we just trained the model um, you know, in a fairly straightforward way, given, this, given the way we set it up. We do logistic regression, so we minimize log loss. We have this late, the scoring function is not linear. We have a late factor model. So it's factorized. If you do alternating gradient descent through log loss, you have to apply chain rule. And then you have to, of course, uh, regularize. So, it's all just, everything I'm doing right here is just applications of everything we discussed in class. Just used judiciously because of the needs of this particular application. We got my using gradient descent, alternating gradient descent, apply the chain rule through log loss. And we can do other things. So uh, the model is actually quite complicated. We, we, we actually simultaneously predicted shooting propensity, passing propensity, and a few other things. So this is visualizing the lane factor model for uh, locations where players are likely to receive passes. So again, the top row is a set of basis vectors, and the bottom row uh, are, the are, the, are the players as a, represented as a non-negative linear combination of the top row. And again, we're enforcing non-negativity because it makes it easier to interpret. Uh, you can model things that are player agnostic, so you can just say, well, the two, the two dimensions of this matrix are location to location, so we're, uh, uh, independent of the players, where do passes tend to flow? So what that means is if, you're, if you tend to be, uh, if, you're, if you're passing from this area, you tend to pass to one of these two areas. If you're passing from this area, you tend to pass to one of these two areas. If you're passing from this, these, one of these two areas, you tend to pass to this area. And all the passing profiles, at least average over all the players, tend to fall into one of these uh, one of these categories. Um, yeah. So this is this, this is the same example, except I grounded it in a specific location. So if you're sp specifically here, so if you're specifically here in this x, then you've activated you know, each of these pro each of these uh, basis vectors by different amounts. So you activated this basis vector a lot, you activated this basis vector a little bit, and so on and so forth. So then you get an averaging of all of these corresponding to how much you activated the, activated the, the top. So you get, you get something like this. So if you're passing from this location where you tend to pass to, similarly, you're getting passed to this location where you're, where you're receiving passes from. Any questions? You guys must really not like sports. They usually get a lot of questions in this section. I guess I should update the examples with the Lakers. Okay. Um, just a couple of things, and I'll be, I'll be done. Just to quickly mention a few things. Um, we can do more than uh, matrices, we can do tensors. So tensors are a um, generalization of matrices to higher order. A matrix is just a tensor of order two, or a two-dimensional tensor. Um, I'm, showing, I'm visualizing here a three-dimensional tensor, or a tensor of order three. And it basically, sounds, it basically is what it sounds like. Some of the math can get a little complicated, but the high-level intuition is very obvious. It's just what it looks like. 
So we're going to do, you know, just like we had bilinear models, we're going to do trilinear models. So for example, um, in online advertising, just as one example, we could have a user profile, an item description, and a query. So if I'm searching for something on Google, let's say, I have a query, and I've got features that describe what that query is about. I could have an item, some ad, and I could have user, like your history or your attributes about it. And now I, can, now I want to model all three as different dimensions or, or modes in the modeling, so I can do a trilinear model. Okay, so just to summarize everything, uh, latent factor models uh, learn a, is, uh, is a form of low rank modeling. Uh, and we started by looking at uh, matrix of observations. And it can tolerate missing values in Y, can also use features, can also go to higher orders, is widely used in the industry uh, today. Um, and of course, there are nonlinear extensions of it. Uh, this type of modeling motivates nonlinear extensions of it that blends these type of ideas with deep learning. And that's a fairly popular research area these days. Okay, uh, next lecture we'll talk about embeddings. That's it. Thanks.